All right, good evening, everybody. Glad to see you out all. Uh, we'll start with our prayer request time. Uh, I was hoping Jim Sharman would be present so he could bring us up to date on Mallory's uh, condition, but I uh, don't see him. I didn't get to touch base with him today. Much more comfortable with her, her situation and her improvement. So uh, I'm, I, I also feel that that's probably where we still are. Uh, as you know, most of you, I think about everybody got contacted that's here that uh, Mallory had been whisked away to the hospital on Monday and uh, we went to work praying for her. and. Uh, by late that evening, she was back home and then was uh, cared for as of yesterday, was being cared for at home with uh, meds and so forth at the house. So that's that's prayer requests that we need to continue praying for. Uh, I want to pray for Caesar. Uh, I've forgotten his last name right now. I, it won't be jumping back into my head. This is, uh, what's his last name? Augustus. No, not Caesar Augustus. <laughs> He's uh, a little late to pray for him, I think. However, uh, he probably would appreciate it. Uh, in any case, Caesar, uh, who has been, uh, she is uh, related to Jessica romantically, I guess. Well, he is related to Jessica romantically, I guess is what it says. And. Uh, yeah, boyfriend has been in the past anyway. I'm not quite sure where all that is now, but uh, today very interested in in uh, uh, the Lord and wanting to. Uh, it seems like he's nearing a decision to walk with the Lord. So, be in prayer for him, and uh, then also be in prayer uh, for, of, of course, Jessica and all the rest of the Velasquez fail. Family, we've been uh, missing them some, and uh, we just need to continue to pray for them. We love them very much and want good things to come for them. Uh, it seemed like I had somebody else. Oh yes, uh, I want you to be praying for two other people. Actually, one of them, his name is Daryl Collins. He's a like Daryl the Junior. I think is this what he is. He said. Uh, we, we don't really know him by Daryl, we know him by Bud, but uh, you can call him Daryl Collins uh, Jr. He's been in an accident and uh, is struggling with some other issues and uh, would want you to pray for him. Then I want you to pray for uh, Kelsey Shoemaker. Um, she's a young lady that uh, Tammy and I know, have known for several years and uh, she's a, she is struggling with uh, some issues as well. So uh, we just need you to lift those people up. Any other prayer requests that I need from you? Okay, well, let's pray and then we'll get into our Bible study tonight. Father, we just thank you for the time that we can come out here and uh, read your word and study it and think about what you have done in our past and Try to put together logically these things that we find in your word and let them begin to expand in their meaning for us so that we can understand more clearly what it is that you have done uh, for us who are Christian. Father, we pray for our, uh, all of these folk that we have listed. We pray for uh, Daryl and I pray for Kelsey. I pray for both of them in their uh, personal lives, the things that they, they are dealing with, that you will meet them where they live and help them to uh, regain footing and uh, to, to uh, gain uh, a greater understanding of you and especially Lord if they don't have uh, a saving knowledge we pray that you would enable them to have that and that they will have the relationship with the Lord that they need uh, Father we pray for our missionary for Vacation Bible School Juliet Rose we pray that you would be with her that you would strengthen her that you would guide her, give her wisdom and insight into what she is doing, and we pray that you would help her to be able to present us a really great uh, set of 
uh, lessons for our kiddos so that they can both understand what she does and uh, be excited about it and uh, understand how that relates to our work in the Lord. Father, we pray that you would guide us uh, in our, our thoughts for our Vacation Bible School. Help us to maintain very uh, great enthusiasm, and we just pray that you will be preparing hearts already, young ones, and uh, their parents to share with us during this uh, week in uh, July. We pray that uh, we will have a great uh, attendance, that we will have folk that uh, come from uh, all over our community and show here with their children that uh, their children may learn of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, uh, Mallory, sustain her, help her to continue to get well quickly. Please be with Jim and that household. Give them rest, for I'm sure that that was a taxing time for them. And Father, we pray that you would be uh, also with our church and all of our various uh, number, that you would protect her and guide her. We pray that you would be with the Velasquez Vale fam family again. We just pray that you'd lift them up and bring them here. Uh, Father, we pray that you will uh, give us wisdom and insight again as we open your word and study. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are studying in Joshua. So we've, we've picked up all the way to Joshua. We dropped over, we skipped over most of Deuteronomy and just got a little piece of it last week. And uh, now we're going on. You will probably recall from last week that uh, we were sitting down here at the edge of the Dead Sea. And, uh, no, here's the Dead Sea. Sorry, got excited. Dead Sea. So we're right in this neighborhood, right here. And Moses looked out over all this country and said, okay, there I get to see it. And this is kind of the, the uh, red line is the rough border of the, kind of the, uh, the tribes of lands that do not include Gad, Reuben, and half of Manasseh. As, as you may remember, they made a deal with uh, Moses, basically, that they would send their troops, their young military men, would go across the Jordan River with the rest of the uh, people of Israel and their families would stay behind and take care of herds and so forth because these are going to become their lands through here on this on this uh, eastern side of the Jordan River, Dead Sea, and uh, Sea of Galilee. So uh, th that was that was there. Now uh, next we saw that uh, after he had looked that over, then he was buried right here. In this in this neighborhood near Bet, uh, this uh, Mount Peor, so uh, that's where Moses was buried. Nobody knows exactly where, uh, but uh, there he is. Okay, now we're ready for Joshua two, and uh, Joshua is taking charge. And we watched that go by, and Joshua one last week looked at all the promises and how the people responded. The people are excited. They've uh, mourned for thirty days for for. Uh, Moses, and now they're ready to go into the promised land. And uh, Joshua is thinking about that as well. It becomes very obvious right here at the front end. He says, Then Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Uh, so this gives us a little uh, view of where they probably were in this area. This is the Dead Sea down here. So here they are in this Abel Shittim area, and they're going to go over across the Jordan River and attack Jericho. Well, he sends an advanced party of two men, uh, spies, to go over there to Jericho. Interesting that he sends two, eh? Mm -hmm. what? <laughs> what happened to the 12 idea? Yeah. Only two are any good, so why not just send two? <laughs> <laughs> so that is what he does. He sends two spies across. So they went and, went and came to the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab. Great beginning, eh? Uh, so they went and came to the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And I, I thought about, you know, should I post, this is a painting of uh, Tissot that he believes 
you know, maybe this is what this looked like. And here you have these guys actually acting interested. And I guess if you think about it, if they were trying to be undercover, as it were, uh, this is pretty good cover. <laughs> Especially when you have the kind of high standard of morality that the people of Israel were supposed to have. And uh, so they go to a harlot's house. I don't like the harlot much. It looks like she needs a shave. But anyway, uh, there you have it. They go across to a harlot's house. And uh, so I, I kind of couldn't help but think about, hey, you know, uh, calling ahead and saying, could I get reservations for two? A uh, king size veggie mattress, penthouse view. Uh, that'll become more clear as you go. It was told the king of Jericho, <clears throat> this is the part of the scripture now, it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. What? Oh my goodness! I thought this was a secret. I thought that this was, uh, that's what it said back there in the first couple of verses, the first verse, it says uh, that Joshua uh, had these spies sent secretly. Somehow or another, the word gets out that they're there. And so the king of Jericho says, look, there's men from uh, the sons of Israel that are here looking, at it, looking this over. So the information got leaked somehow. Uh, and the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. So maybe they didn't look quite like they did there in that first uh, painting that I showed you. Uh, maybe they were actually very awkward and out of place because somebody saw them go into Rahab's house and said, man, them guys are not from around here. We've got to tell somebody about this. Something's going on. Uh, they look like they're dressed up uh, as those people that we've been so nervous about across the river. Uh, people know about these Hebrews by now. Uh, they've been... Uh, kicking people's tails up and down the east side of of, uh, of the Jordan, and they see how many they are, and they're just kind of going, well, when are they coming over here? Uh, it's a bit of a surprise, because as I understand it, uh, the Jordan was uh, pretty much swollen up at this time. So uh, in any case, there they are. So they get a warrant for their arrest. I'm kind of putting this in today's vernacular. The king... Jericho says, bring these guys out. We have a warrant for their arrest. Uh, so uh, the woman says, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. She pleads the fifth, eh? Well, maybe. Uh, more like a lie. Yeah, see, uh, you got to be careful about what you think about lying sometimes, I think. In any case, I like this, uh, this uh, painting very much. It, it really captures her, uh, her willingness to, to uh, point people in the wrong direction. The fact that these guys are looking for uh, someone and, and, that, and the like. So it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. Uh, that's what she says. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. Okay, that's not just lying. That's like about four Pinocchios. Uh, but she had brought them up to the roof and hid them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Uh, and there they are. This is your uh, king-sized veggie mattress. Uh, with a penthouse view. So there you go. So the men pursued them on the road to Jordan, to the Jordan, to the fords, and soon, as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. So try and get this in, in your mind how this worked. Uh, the men, there, they, there were some guys that were after them. They apparently went out the gate of the city and, uh, um, we're going to hunt them down. Thought they, they could track them down outside of the city. And then in addition, the city gates were shut. So in other words, if, if somehow they had stayed in the city, uh, we're gonna make sure that we find them out. So we're finding them out either way, whether they're outside the city or inside the city. This is, this is what was thought. Uh, now before they lay down, 
Uh, apparently these fellows are going to get uh, a nap. Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. Or maybe they're not going to get a nap. She gets, she gets them up and, she, and says to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were before the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So uh, Rahab is now talking to these men. She, she has been moved already. She knows that where these guys are from. She knows what they're made of, knows what their God is like. And so she's already decided what she wants out of this. She, she has uh, made up her mind and she's making this speech to these men. Uh, she knows she's going to help them out, is helping them out. And uh, uh, so she begins by telling them, look, it, I know what your God has done for you. I know how your people are. Uh, we've heard all these things that you've done uh, before you're under your God. Uh, verse 11, when we heard it, she goes on talking about her own people now. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord our God, your God, he is God in heaven and above and on, the, on earth beneath. Man, <laughs> you know, it, it, it'd be nice to sometimes talk to some struggling soul who already knew this much, you know, that would say to you, Man, you know, I've got a ton of problems, but I've come to believe that God is king and that uh, he's taking care of you, that I need to be right here, right now, and listening to what you have to say. Uh, but that's what Rahab is. She's, she's aware of who she has come to deal with, and she proclaims it to these men. Uh, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above, and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, she goes on to making her case. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth. And spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Now, I can't help but sort of stop and reflect about this woman named Rahab who has enough spiritual consciousness that she can recognize God and recognize that she needs to make a, an agreement with these men and, and become a servant of God. And out of her people, this is the situation. She is apparently a prostitute. That's what they're calling her, a harlot. And yet, her entire family lives right there with her. Wow. It needs to make us pause and think, I, I believe, what the depth of uh, depravity, I think would be a good way to say it, of the people were that the, that the uh, Israelites began to remove from the land. Uh, if you have someone, this is apparently one of the best of the people, that, and this is their condition. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I can make a huge case on that. There's just not enough evidence to do so. But I think it bears reflecting and thinking about. Uh, in any case, she asked for her whole entire household to be spared. Uh, promise when you rock this house, that's the way I'm putting it, uh, you will spare me and mine. Uh, your God rocks, you rock, so when you rock this house, spare me and mine. So the men said to her, our life for yours. These are the two spies speaking now. The men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Okay, fair enough. Good deal. We'll take that deal, Rahab. Thanks. Sounds like that's the end of that deal. Don't 
No, don't think it is. Verse 15, then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. Now down the wall and skedaddle, basically, is the idea here. And I like this little picture. Uh, here she is, letting them down. I don't really think it was the red cord she let them down by, but anyhow, anyhow she's there from the person who composed this brought it in. There's this guy, can you see him? He's getting his head stuck, uh, stepped on, it's kind of humorous. Anyway, she said to them, go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward, you may go on your way. So you got to lay low, boys, lay low. Uh, the men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you which you have made us swear. Unless we come into the land, you, when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down. And it's like, okay, so now wait a minute. If we don't see a yellow ribbon, no, wrong song. If we don't see a scarlet thread, uh, in other words, you've got to hold up your end, Rahab. There's, there's more to this than just what we've said so far. We want you to put this red thread out the window so we can recognize your place. And the here's a, another. What? Your picture was right. It said that it was the red cord that she mm -hmm. let them down. So you use that cord. That's not what mine says, but I'm happy if, it, if that's the way it goes. No, that's not what it says. Thread in the window through which you let us down. Okay. The whole bubble. So for me, yeah. See, I think there's a debate about which way it goes. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna argue that. It can, if it's a thread, it's mighty difficult to. So it's got to be a cord, or perhaps a rope, or something like that. As far away, it has to be. We get enough threads wrapped together. All right. Well, we can argue that. Let's go. <laughs> no. uh, when it's let it go uh, in this uh, you can see in this one however uh, before I let it go uh, this artist rendered it the rope and then an, an additional uh, thread here or, or cord whatever in any case uh, there they are they're going down uh, uh, the wall and it's as if she's already started them down the wall uh, because it says back here uh, Let's see. I'm trying to remember how. Oh yeah, verse 15. Then she let them down the by a rope through the window, and I can just see this. It's sort of in my mind's eye. There they are, uh, scurrying out this out this uh, uh, window at the top of the, of the house and uh, whispering to one another. Oh, now, now wait a minute. You got to have this red card present, and uh, so that's what we got to do. And she's telling them lay low and and. Uh, so she says, they say, um, backing up now, unless we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and, uh, and gather yourself into the house, your father and your mother and your house and your brothers and all your father's household. So I was thinking of uh, Jerry when I wrote this, there's other contractual limitations. Uh, everybody we say, we say has to be in this house. That's part of the contract that they're making with her is look you gotta get the red, red cord and everybody has to be in this house uh, that we're gonna say it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be free in other words if somebody here leaves after he's been here I'm sorry he's out out is out uh, but anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which you have made us swear. So in other words, if you divulge the plan, the agreement's null and void. Uh, we don't need anybody, anybody knowing what we're up to. So uh, they make quite an awful lot of, uh, of an agreement here with uh, Rahab at the wall. And she says, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So the contract, as I say, begins in good faith. 
and then there they go off uh, to uh, the, near the Jordan. That's where they're headed. Now they departed and came to the hill country and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road, but had not found them. Then the two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over. Actually, I don't think they did go to the Jordan. Now that I read it again, I think they went, they expected those pursuers to go out toward the Jordan. And they went on up into the hill country a little ways and waited until the coast was clear, so to speak. Uh, I, that's a phrase I missed. Dog on it. Then the two returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they related to him all that had happened to them. So on the land, two spies escaped notice and slink back across the river. Uh, so there they go back to talk to uh, Joshua. They said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. Uh, so we basically, we got them where we want them. This is going to be uh, something that we can do. Uh, Joshua, let's get them. Okay, now my question is, why would God save this household? He recognized him. Recognized him. More explanation than deal the deal. <laughs> deal the deal. <laughs> Didn't have to make that deal though. Yeah. What did she do? I mean, well, she saved their lives. She didn't kill them. Yeah. She wrecked her own. She saved their lives. What else she did there? Well, she gave them good information. What she did to her own people. There you go. She threw her own people under the bus. Why did she do it? I believe you're right. They believed, uh, she believed, and those other people were not in belief of God. They were not interested in going over there near the Jordan, saying, shouting across the Jordan River and saying, hey, what is it you guys want anyway? You know? And then be ready to do whatever they ask. They weren't going to change their lives. This posed a new start for her, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a new start. Going into a into a uh, community and a society, if they've learned anything, if they've done any of that shouting back and forth across the river, by now she knows that there are people uh, over there that if you live among them, you don't have, you don't get to have this occupation. You're not even allowed. It's not part of the way we think about life. And so. Uh, She's not, she's not in that uh, frame of, she's maybe ready to drop that frame of reference from her life and from her mind. So that's another possibility. What relationship does this family have to the family of Jesus? She's in Joseph, the father of Jesus. She's in his genealogy. So, uh, and also, of course, uh, in just a little bit, David the king. Uh, so, uh, obviously, there is some good stuff in this family that's coming along uh, as, you know, it, they're, they're, hopefully that's part of it anyway, that they're passing along uh, something of character. And uh, obviously, if she passes on this belief in God, uh, that's the big thing that I believe King David was loved by God for. I don't think that David was sort of particularly righteous, uh, I think he just believed God. That's what he did. And I, I think God wants us to be that. You know, I'm not trying to give any any excuse for not being righteous. We need to be. We need to become righteous. 
But we need to believe and to keep God forefront and the hero of our lives. And the, uh, you know, I love the way David answers uh, when they ask him, you know, about Goliath. He just says, "Look, at this guy has no business shouting down our God. We're not having it." And I love that. So Joshua three is where we are now. Let me see where I am on time. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out, set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. So Joshua and everybody moves away from where they're camped, down next to the Jordan River. And here's a photograph of when they did uh, At the end of the three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp. And if you remember back from last week's lesson, that's one of the things that had been said in the camp was, uh, you go, I'm sending messengers, Joshua sends messengers through the camp, and he says to them, in three days' time, we're leaving. Be ready. And so this is, that, that's what's happened. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. So here's a kind of an interesting uh, rendition of that event. Uh, you're going to find out in a verse or two that these guys are really too close because uh, apparently you had to really get some distance between you and the Ark of the Covenant. However, there shall be between you and it, the, the Ark of the Covenant, a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. That's uh, 3,000 feet or about 1,000 yards. So a good half mile, at least, a little more than a half mile, you're to stay away from the Ark of the Covenant. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. I'm not quite sure what all that means, but it possibly is that you've got to allow enough distance between you and the Ark of the Covenant so that it can be seen out in front. You know where it is, you all can make for that spot. Uh, you know, if you are if you have something too close and you just have a big crowd of people around it, you can't really tell necessarily exactly where you should be in reference to that object. So that may be part of it. It may also be a matter of safety. Uh, I'm calling it theistic distancing. Mm connection with our current problem. <laughs> so I was in a mood. There you go. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Um, consecrate yourselves. What does that mean? Okay, set yourself apart. How would you do it? Well, I would think you know, if there were any question about whether you were clean, yeah, you'd want to take care of that. Consecrate yourself. Perhaps even a spiritual uh, thing where you say, wow, tomorrow's a great day. We've got to be up for this. You know, this should be a great day. Uh, you're living as people who were less than 20 years old when you left uh, Egypt. You might not have even been born yet. Uh, if you are, you're still less than 20 years old or right at 20 years old. So people from the ages of, of, uh, of 20 to 40, especially uh, in this crowd, are going to relate to this very, very heavily because all of their parents have died and here they are with the heritage of having left Egypt being promised that they're going to be in the promised land and they've traveled all this distance and had manna all this time and now they've, they've taken control of the eastern side of the Jordan River and they've been able to see across the Jordan River and they know that's where the promised land lies. They're itching to get in and get it to be a part of it. And so for them, 
this is a big, big day the next day. And their, their thought process needs to kind of match that. You don't want to, you know, I don't, I, when I got married, it was a huge day. Uh, there, there weren't any, there weren't any days like it. Um, probably not even the day on which I was baptized, although it was a big day too. Uh, but that one sort of snuck up on me, you know. I called my mom business and uh, one day in the, in the granary driveway, I decided, you know, today is the day I'm going to be baptized. I think it's right for me to baptize. So I made sure that the, all that work that Sunday morning, it was a big deal for me, but I didn't work my way up to it. Uh, my wedding was a different thing. It was, uh, it was, it was very... <laughs> nearly traumatic in nature. Uh, well, it was. I mean, I'm serious. Uh, I was giving my word. It was important to me. I had promised this woman that I would be with her for the rest of my life. And I was worried about whether I could actually, did I, whether I personally was prepared to meet that. To actually do that. And uh, so it was a very hard thing, uh, and yet great, wonderful. We, you know, very glad we were, we were married. But that's the kind of thing. I mean, it's these people went through. Think of those kind of days in your life. That these people have waited for years and years and years, and finally, here was the day, and it was a big, big deal. So then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over the over ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall, moreover, command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will sure, assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Good night. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off. And the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. A big deal. Now here's an artist rendition. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan, with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the Lord, before the people, and when those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephath. And if you ever thought about this miracle, it had to be a long way. And it was a special miracle because it's not like um, if it were just a dam, then the waters would have spread out all over that valley. That's not what happened. They apparently stood up in a heap and backed up the Jordan River. I know not else what to make of it. Uh, you know, Great distance way at Adam, 
the city that is besides Zarathustra. And if you look it up, uh, you can see this is the sort of the top of the Dead Sea here, maybe even down this far. And Zarathustra is up here, and there's Adan. So back up as far as Adan. This is when you go looking at your. Oh, uh, to give you a guesstimation, around 30 miles. Uh, it's 65, approximately 65 miles from right here to right up here. From the edge, the, the uh, southern edge of Galilee to the northern edge of, of the Dead Sea. So around 30 miles of water backed up. And those which were flowing down toward the sea of the, of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Saved through water. Um, Egyptian army is dead behind them at the Red Sea and Palestinians, the Canaanites are, are to be dead ahead of them. So yeah, I think that's a really good uh, observation. Uh, I think people just make observations like that. You should be making them about the Bible. Uh, your, your writers often do. Uh, does the water of baptism provide any basis for unity and belonging to one another? Yeah, it does. Uh, it better. <laughs> We're completely out of line as a, as a membership practicing church if it doesn't, because one of the things that we say is if you want to be a member of our church, you'll need to be immersed. So baptism is very important. The waters of baptism do unite us. We all have been through it, as it were. Uh, and you can find this again, I think it's in 1 Peter 3, where uh, Peter talks about uh, the water and Noah and being saved through the water. Noah is saved through the water, then the Egyptians are, are or rather the, the Hebrew people coming out of Egypt are saved through the water. Now these people enter the promised land through the water. So what I'm asking basically is this, when these men and women are with each other in the days to come, when these men are fighting a shoulder to shoulder, will this event unite them Give them a shared memory, something that they work from because they were through it together. Obeying the command of a God who can stand water up for 30 miles. Who's supposed to be able to stand in front of you? Anybody? Really? Come on. Now, remember to tell your brother where he's getting down. You remember the water, man? Let's go. And maybe we should be that way in our own uh, encouragement of one another when we get down, when we fail, when we have. Uh, struggles and trials, you know? Hey, remember the water. Remember who you are. And uh, let's keep moving. Okay, uh, verse 4. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves 
12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the 12 men whom, the, the, whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Lord, before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Once again, it becomes a moment of memory and God is, in, is ordering Joshua, look, you've got to set something up so that nobody forgets what happened here. This is, what, what has happened for us that is the same thing? Two, two things that we do. So at the cross, well, that would definitely be uh, a moment of memory it, it would actually be the kind of thing that I'm talking about I hadn't anticipated that but yeah that would work because uh, it is a physical actual physical object uh, to which we put meaning in memory uh, I had more in mind a couple of events they're not really things that we put in that our practice as Christians we do communion every Lord's Day, don't we? We participate in the bread and in the cup. And we remember, we remember what has happened. Uh, this is the way God through the ages has worked. He has said, here's a great big event that I'm delivering you through, and I want you to remember it. What's the other one for us? Baptism. Baptism. Tell me why. What do we? What? What's the form of baptism? It's, it's in, and what does that mean? What is it? What's the word? Death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it's a memory. These stones shall become a memorial for the sons of Israel. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel, and they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Now, this is not uh, that much fun for us as a general rule, as uh, Americans. We like to read through a thing and say, okay, you gave him orders, and he did it, instead of going back and redoing the whole thing. But I think that's partly, it's that important, that I want to tell you again that he actually did it. And so that's why I think you get told twice here. Uh, then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan. So Joshua went another step here. These 12 stones initially came out, and he set them up where they lodged. Now, now read again here in verse 9. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. For the priests who carried the ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people. According to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed. <laughs> Interesting thing that they hurried. Anyway, uh, just thinking about these 12 stones that are now become something of a, a pillar-like thing in the middle of the Jordan. If they, I don't know how they stood up to that awful flood when, when, they, when they got out of the way and that flood came roaring down through there. But in any case, there they were, and standing there. And anybody that wanted to go down there for years afterward could go down there and say, there stands a pillar of stones out in the middle of the Jordan. How did it get there? Well, they did it while the Jordan was dry. That's how. And then they tell the story, of course, of the crossing. The people hurried and crossed over. And when all the people had finished crossing, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people, 
the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them. So some of the people didn't go, right? Yeah. The families of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh stayed on the other side. I bet they were right down there watching that whole thing. <laughs> For one thing, they had to say goodbye to their men, but uh, also, if they had any idea what was coming on, they had to see this. And so they were there looking, I'm sure. But they actually, uh, Gad and Reuben and Manasseh, it says cross over, remember in their deal, cross over first, just as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed for battle before the Lord to the desert plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. So not much. <laughs> it's questionable, isn't it? Uh, certainly, I think, I think uh, it, it would be a hard thing to measure very accurately. But I think, I think ultimately you have to say very much because you would probably want to say that Moses gained this aura or this grand respect by the time he died, and that becomes very obvious. You know, then the people uh, mourned for him for 30 days, and uh, so I, I get the comment because many. And now it's back to flood stage. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. And I know if you're familiar with the term Gilgal, it's a it's a city that's used an awful lot uh, throughout uh, from this point going forward at least. Uh, I love that little name Gilgal. It means rolling, and I just. It tickles me a little. Gilgal. You just see, uh, you know, like a stone rolling over, and it kind of goes, Gilgal, you know. Anyway, now the people came up. There we go. We're done with that. Now, those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall reform them, inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done in to the Red Sea, Tammy, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So, here we got all of that in, and it's 6.56, and so we're done. Are there any questions? Okay. They go around. <laughs> well, no, I think that I think the the text is fairly clear that at this period of the year, at the harvesting time, the Jordan was usually in a flood stage during those days. So uh, it would have been after flood stage when they went back. Uh, there is another story about crossing back, so we'll get to that later on. Elijah and Elisha also later. Yes, later on, yes. Alright. Y'all have a good Wednesday night through Sunday morning.